Well, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next keynote speaker, Professor Kate Bowers. Uh, Kate Bowers is Professor in Crime Science at the University College London, Department of Security and Crime Science. She has worked in the field of crime science for over 20 years and her research interests focus on the use of quantitative methods in crime analysis and prevention. She has published over 100 papers and book chapters on criminology. Her most recent research focuses on developing advanced methods of crime prediction, improving the evidence base for crime prevention and using innovative data sets to answer crime and security questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Kate Bowers. Morning, everybody. Um, so I start, I'd like to start off by just uh, thanking uh, the team at Queensland's Police and the AIC for um, extending such a warm welcome and for organising what I think has been a really thought-provoking programme. So thank you for that. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So what I'd like to do um, with the time that I've got in this morning is touch on three different themes, which I'm hoping will add up to a, an account of how we go about understanding crime problems and ultimately try to help to deal with, it, with them um, at the Jill Dando Institute where I work at UCL. And those three themes are crime science, crime analysis, and crime prevention. And um, I'll just touch a little bit on what I'm going to say first. So I'm going to start with a definition of what crime science is. That's quite helpful in kind of motivating uh, the things I'm going to be saying later on. I'm then going to give you a couple of short stories, because I know that people like these things in, short, in story form. And I'm going to talk about how crime analysis, and we haven't t talked an awful lot about crime analysis yet, about how crime analysis um, can actually help us with understanding crime. And it can help us with developing good crime strategies. I hope I'm able to convince you, particularly that using innovative data, the kind of data that we haven't been using very much so far, can really help us with strategy development. And then I'm going to just finally conclude with a little bit about crime prevention itself and taking these ideas on through to effective crime prevention. And one thing that we really believe in the work that we've been doing is that we need to really concentrate on the kind of information we need in practice to enhance reduction in specific local conditions. So it's coming back to this idea of context and how context really matters when we're coming up with the best solution to a problem. We can't just tell you what we think works and then expect it to work with your own local conditions. We need to think about that more fully. Um, Anna Stewart yesterday um, said she wasn't going to talk about statistics and she said she's a, she's a numbers girl and she found that quite difficult. Um, I'm afraid I'm a numbers girl and I am going to talk to you about statistics so please do bear with me a little bit and if there's anything that's technical that anybody doesn't understand shout or, or ask me a little bit about, about that later on. Okay, so I'm going to start, before I go into explaining what crime science is, by showing you this diagram. How many, see, how many of you have seen this before, this diagram? Put your hand up if you've seen this before. Does anybody know what this is? Wow, nobody. Nobody's seen this before. Maybe one person. Okay, so this is something called the Ponzo illusion. Okay, and what we do as humans with, with the kind of brains that we have is that we take shortcuts and we make assumptions about things all the time. And I don't know if it works for you, but when I look at this particular diagram here, I can see what I think is a train track. Yeah, can you see that? And you can see these two yellow lines. And what our eyes do, because we're so used to interpreting this kind of thing in a three-dimensional train track sort of way, is we, we actually perceive the yellow line. Can you see those two yellow lines? We, we perceive the one at the top as being longer than the one at the bottom. And in fact, the two of them are exactly the same length. So what our brain is doing is it's short wiring this kind of, this, this, this short cutting, um, this, this sort of way of interpreting this. And it's, it's easy for us to do that. And the reason why I raise this is because as human beings, we take and make assumptions all the time. And we do it for good reason, because it helps with our survival. So one of the reasons why we do this kind of thing is because it helps us in a flight or fight situation to make a quick decision. 
However, this kind of hardwiring is actually a lot less useful. It can, in fact, be unhelpful to us um, when we make assumptions that what occurs in one situation will continue to occur in the other. And we need to really fight against this as scientists and practitioners. So the discipline of crime science, what is it? It's the application of scientific methods and knowledge from many different disciplines. We're incredibly multidisciplinary in what we do to the development of practical and ethical ways to reduce crime. So put simply, crime science finds ways to cut crime using the best information that we have available. And just to kind of give you a, a flavour of the kinds of things we do as crime scientists, as I said, we, we work across many disciplines. And what I love about working at our place is that you walk down the corridor and you knock on a door and the person you find the other side of it is not necessarily going to be a criminologist or a sociologist. We have people from a huge range of different fields working with us and for us. We have people who are computer scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, epidemiologists, geographers, the whole whole range and all these disciplines have got a part to play in helping us to understand crime problems and I hope that I can convince you of that um, as I go through some of the examples. Um, we're very much advocates of the approach that Peter Martin uh, mentioned yesterday in encouraging police and he said to own the science of their profession and so we work with the police. We want to make sure that everything we do has very practical, real-world value. So we are very applied as researchers, and we value most of all the research that has real-world impact. We want to help reduce crime out there. We don't want to just sit in our ivory towers and think thoughts. We want to be practical in the way that we can help out in understanding crime problems. Um, one kind of theme of what we tend to do as crime scientists is we tend to be um, primarily with, with, um, um, concerned with preventing crime upstream of the problem happening in the first place. And the way that we tend to do that is by focusing on the crime event rather than criminality. And coming back to this idea of assumptions, people assume that they're interested in crime when they're actually interested in criminality. These are two very different things when you think about it. Criminality is to do with the disposition of offenders. And, it's, and thinking about the cause of, of criminality, you need to think about the genetics of offenders, their upbringing, their situation, long-term causal factors that, that make people turn to crime, and that's criminality. However, what we tend to do is focus on crime, which is actually an event. It's, it's, it's an event in a particular place at a particular time. And by looking at the situation surrounding events in particular space and time, we can start seeing what it is about that environment that makes crime a likely thing to happen, that makes that particular situation vulnerable to crime. So here, instead of thinking about the long-term um, offender uh, um, um, causes, we're thinking about things like Intox intoxicated people meeting each other um, and, and that becoming a, a, a provoking factor in some sort of argument in a particular area, which might lead to an assault, for instance. Or we're thinking about um, the lack of so natural surveillance in areas, which cause them to be great places for robbery, for instance, because of the, of the, of the, of the way that they're hidden from, from um, passers-by. We're, we're thinking about places um, where you've got um, you know, no guardianship or, we, or there's a lack of general um, um, assistance or crime prevention measures in place, which means that it's open to manipulation or opportunity. So we're not saying that there isn't this massive role for uh, dealing with offenders. And of course, this is what the criminal justice system does fantastically effectively. Um, however, one way to think about this is thinking about the amount of offences that are committed to actually what ends up within, um, be, becoming in a conviction. And you can see from this slide that there's quite a lot of attrition between those two places. So for every 100 offences committed, we have only 50% that ever got reported to the police. We have only 30% that are recorded by the police. And this leads to 2% of offences for which there are convictions. So the criminal justice system is great. It has a place, but what it can't do is prevent all crime. It can't deal with the whole of the crime problem. And particularly, it can't deal with the kind of high volume, perhaps lower harm crimes um, that just happen every day in many situations and are not necessarily undertaken by um, criminal career offenders. So we're just saying that by looking at um, 
that crime rather than criminality, we can get a different picture to help us with thinking about doing prevention upstream of a problem um, happening in the first place, if we can. Okay, so um, we, uh, we um, consider ourselves very much to be multidisciplinary scientists and engineer. engineers. We use the, the word science in, um, uh, on purpose because we like to think we take a scientific approach and we want to do this to help us prevent making those kind of assumptions that can just lead us to do the same automatic thing in different cases and think that that's going to work. So it's the humility of science that we're interested in. Um, Nick Tilly recently was saying that he thinks that we're a load of engineers. And he's very probably right, because engineering is, a, is about problem solving and research development, where what happened yesterday, what happens now, builds on what happened yesterday to extend success and to identify and remedy failures. And the two words there, builds on, is really important. We're not, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel, as people were saying yesterday. We need to do experimentation where we're learning, and in, in the prog progress in that learning, we're coming up with new. Um, altered strategies that hopefully would be more effective. So our, our bread and butter as crime scientists really is, is this is bottom line here, is that we want to build evidence bases which can be useful in security sciences, forensics, counter, countering terrorism and cybercrime. And we build evidence bases first on what the problems look like, but secondly about how we might go about trying to prevent those particular problems. So we're interested in, in, in evidence from both those perspectives. Okay, so I said I was going to tell you some short stories. Now, it, this, this, this does get a bit technical, but try and bear with me. This first short story is about some stuff that we've been doing, um, helping the police with um, designing effective uh, patrolling strategies. So how do you do perfect, um, um, uh, effective patrol? Um, and so this story of our involvement with this um, started quite some time ago now with the ideas surrounding what we, what we, we call repeat victimisation. Now, put your hand up if you've heard of repeat victimisation. Some of you must have heard of this concept. Great, so that's at least half of you. Okay, so the idea of repeat victimisation and, and the empirical evidence shows us, and can I, by the way, I just want to say I'm going to be talking about burglary in particular for the next few slides. Okay, so we're thinking about burglary problems as, a, as, a, as, um, as an example here. Is if you were burgled, so you're this poor blue um, um, house on this diagram here, if you've been burgled, the, um, all the evidence shows that you're at a much heightened risk of being burgled again within the short space of time following that initial event. So from, particularly in the first couple of days following the particular event, and um, in the first week, we can see the hump of risk here in the first week following a particular event. You're much, whatever anybody says about lightning not striking twice, it's not true. You are much more likely to be at risk of a burglary if you've just had one happen um, recently. And that's a good thing from the point of view of thinking about intervention because it shows us that we need to get in there quickly to try and do something about the problem when it first happens. Now, the interesting thing about this concept is it's more generalisable than just to the house that's been burgled itself. And you can see on here that I've shown the number of doors apart different buildings are on this particular chart. And what we found, really interestingly, was that actually if you're the neighbour of a house that's just been recently burgled, you are also at heightened risk for a short space of time following that initial burglary of being a victim of burglary yourself. And that risk kind of dissipates across the street, as you can see, back down to... So when you're, by the time you're about 20 houses away, you're probably less at risk of things happening with that short space of time. And so this is a kind of interesting thing from, a, from the point of view of understanding crime problems, because it's a, a good way of imagining it is that it's actually quite... There's a contagious element to burglary. So it clusters in both space and time. And it means that they're kind, they're kind of, it's almost like a neighbourhood might catch burglary as a problem for a short space of time. And knowing this piece of empirical evidence surely must be able to help us with preventing it right. How do we, how we, how do we put this into some sort of prevention approach? Um, well, on top of just um, you know, going back to recent victims themselves, we are interested in trying to come up with good crime maps, intelligent crime maps for police officers to tell them where doing perhaps a little bit of high visibility patrolling and revisiting these places might be the most effective um, use of their time. So we want to see where that highest risk is and how could we use this contagious burglary idea to do that? Um, well, you've probably all seen by now you know, the traditional sort of maps that you see from policing organisations 
locations. And often what they do is they, they add up where they, they might take the last year of burglary that's happened and they'll add up the risk in some sort of grid square approach like this and they'll say, in the last year, if we have a look on, on average, these squares that you can see here are, have had particular risk of burglary. And so, it, you know, it might be better to just go to those places, right, because they're the places that crime happens in the past. So, so presumably they're going to be the places that, that crime continues to happen. Um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to put on top of this kind of traditional mapping, this algorithm that spreads the risk when you've had an initial burglary on the street. So we wanted to put the contagious element on top of this and add those two algorithms together to see if we could come up with a more intelligent map. So we did just that, and you can see at the, at the top here, we've got an illustration of a place where it's been burgled, that red dot there in the middle, and you can see what we've done in order to do this kind of adding in of risk is we've, we've kind of drawn a circle of risk around this burglary, and we, and we say when it's first happened, it's its most high, high risk, and then the kind of risk dissipates back down to base levels over time. And we can actually add this into the mapping system. Um, when we did do this kind of adding into the mapping system, System. We then had these two different maps, one that just looked at the past and one that looked at the past but also added in this contagious element. And we said, well, OK, we can give these to police, but how do we know how effective they are? So one thing you need to do with these intelligence projects is actually test them for predictability, right? So, so we, we came up with some methods for doing that. And it's a little bit technical, but if you imagine a kind of map like this on the bottom right-hand side, what you do is you just you, um, you basically take, take these little grid squares and you line them up from the highest predictive risk all the way down to the lowest predictive risk and then what you do is you you put you superimpose the burglaries that happened the day after the map was created or, or two days after the map created and you see how many of the kind of most high levels of predicted risk um, uh, uh, boxes incorporate those future burglary problems. So if we had a look at what we did is we looked at our old mapping system and we found that the top 20% of, of um, predicted risk according to the standard method captured 42, three, uh, sorry, 46% of burglaries for the next two days. Um, and this new map called ProMap, we like to call it um, fondly, captures 62% um, of burglaries in the following two days. So it looked like putting in this contagious risk element made things slightly more effective in terms of predictability. We started seeing that these were the areas that were hot according to these maps were in fact areas where burglaries happened over the next two days. It's a small game. It's not a magic bullet. And we've been talking about this idea of things not being a magic bullet. But it's a game over just using traditional approach. So being smug and thinking, yes, you know, we've got these fantastic predictable maps and we can tell the police officers where to go and this is a bit more effective than just using the old story. We started thinking more recently about usability of mapping. So I don't know about you, but if somebody gave me a kind of map on the bottom that looks like the bottom right there, you go, Phew. Well, I don't know how I'm supposed to patrol that box. You can see that a lot of them are on these gridded squares. But actually, we don't use space like that. None of us do. We use networks, don't we? We use road networks, street networks. Everybody does. Offenders do, police do, victims do. So what we really need to be thinking about is making the mapping a little bit more useful by putting it in, on the network space. So uh, the way in which we were doing this is we were thinking about what would be near on the network. And what is near on the network is not necessarily near from a crow fly sort of perspective. And I'll just give you an illustration of that. Imagine this is, a, I don't know if you can see this very well, but imagine this kind of area is where there, there's been a burglary where you can see this, um, this red cross here. And I don't know if you can see, but just to the top right of it, there's a tiny little bit of segment um, which is, kind of, is, not, is not connected to where the other burglary was, right? So they're actually, even though they're close from the point of view of, of the crow flies distance, they're not close in network space. And in fact, an offender, if he needed to get between these two places, would have to take that entire um, route round. So kind of diffusing the risk in the old way, where we just do it in a circular way, wasn't perhaps the most effective way of doing things. And so we wanted to produce maps that took into account the network structure and the way in which we use space um, from a network point of view. 
Um, we managed to do this more recently. And again, this is only because we have access to people who have got fantastic mathematical and computer science skills that were able to do this kind of work. Um, and just just to, to sort of solve one of the, pu the puzzles we had, we realized that if you were going to diffuse risk down this network, this predicted risk down the network, it's not as simple as doing it as in a circle because you've got junctions that get in the way everywhere. So you can see what happens on the left-hand side is you've got this lovely risk kind of that's, that's almost flowing down the network, but then you've got to decide what to do with it when you get to a junction. And so we just came up with this idea that we're going to just, if, if there, was two, um, there, was, there was two different segments leading off a junction, we were just going to equally distribute the risk. And if there was three, there'd have been a third of risk going down each of the streets. And if there's two, it's just a half. So we did quite a basic um, um, algorithm to, tr to try and get around that problem. But it means that you can end up with a sort of um, map that you can see on the right-hand side here. Here. And this shows predicted levels of burglary risk on a particular um, street network system um, for a particular area in the Met, um, um, in, the, in, the, in the Metropolitan Police area, uh, District. District. So one thing that you might see from that, and we were kind of encouraged, it doesn't necessarily always have to be the case, but can you see that there's a kind of bit of clustering of where those hot streets are. We were thinking that this actually might be quite a good thing because if you can imagine trying to come up with a policing route, you might be able to kind of join these segments or bits and pieces together and come up with a reasonably um, doable patrol that you might undertake to go around these areas to give them a bit of high visibility policing. When, um, for instance, uh, even drive-throughs of police cars on the way that aren't, that aren't on blue lights could go around some of this street network to give a little bit more presence in these areas where the risk is high. Um, so, as with anything else, we have to think about whether or not going to this street network design actually gave us some sort of predictive gain or not. So it's, it's not only is it practically usable, but it's, does it help to predict where the, where the crime is likely to be? Um, and so just as we did with the other map, we had to look at predictability levels here. And we, um, we, we were able to repeatedly, for um, a lot of different um, coverages, compare the planar, and planar by here I mean the gridded system, with the network system. And we were very pleased to see, after having gone through all those statistics and doing it a large number of times, there does seem to be a modest gain of using a network-based system from a predictive point of view as well. So if we just have a look at one example on this particular chart, if you take the top 10% of predicted high-risk squares um, for a grid or plane, the coordinate system, they capture about 20% of the future burglary problem here, according to this particular area of, of coverage. Um, but if you take the top 10% as predicted by the network, we're looking at 25% uh, of the future um, burglaries captured. And you can see all along the way, it's modestly, again, no silver bullet, but mod modestly, it does better than the planar system. So, again, here we are, and we're we're getting smug because we're like, here's this fantastic map that tells us, you know, it's really highly predictable and we can tell the police, you know, you can, you can, we can even show you nice routes to take down these places. But it's coming back to this question about implementation and how we actually change this into something that's useful from the point of view of operational policing in practice. So what police tend to do when they're trying to do this kind of predictive patrol, sorry, preventative patrol, is they tend to do hotspots policing kind of work. And you've probably all heard of these, of these different types of, of methods. And it's high visibility policing being a, a classic example of that. Um, and there have been evaluation studies, and therefore there has been a systematic review of whether or not these kind of approaches actually do reduce crime out there in the real world, not on my map, but out there in the real world. And the great news is that these kinds of um, geographically targeted bits of um, high, high visibility patrol do modestly um, but significantly reduce crime problems overall. I'm saying overall, and we'll get on to that later on. Um, but the trouble is, right, in these evaluations, nobody told you how much you need to do. And that's a completely different question, right? So across all these things that went into this fancy study, we didn't know how, me how many minutes of patrolling time on the street that actually meant that, some, that, that the police would need to do. And we're more interested in, in looking at how new sources of data can help us with that question. Um, the only study that really looked at the amount of patrol that you need to do before the, what I'm going to go on to next was by um, Coper, and he estimated that 
Um, uh, he was looking at actually patrol, um, um, foot patrol versus a drive-by by a car. So he was comparing it to just a, a police drive-by, to different levels of foot patrol. And he found that up to 10 minutes of patrol has no significant difference from just going once through in a, in a, high, in a, in a police vehicle. But what he did find is from 10 minutes upwards to about 15 minutes, there really did seem to be some sort of gain of taking the foot patrol approach over just the drive-by. But interestingly, this started to diminish after 15 minutes. The effectiveness of this started to diminish after 15 minutes. So it looked like optimally, you know, people might be patrolling for that sort of length of time in the area. Now, that's great, but it was a very expensive study, and it was in one tiny area, and it was people observing what the police were doing. We're talking about innovation at this conference. So we thought, can we not use innovative data to have a look at this kind of thing instead? And we had, um, we had a great opportunity because the Met have shared with us, and I can tell you how from a data protection point of view later on if anybody's interested, they, they shared with us officer radio GPS data. And of course, this means that what we're able to now do is see where the, is, is see, have a timestamp on where a particular officer was um, at a, in a particular ge geographical location. And by having that information, you can reconstruct the foot patrols of different officers. Okay, so we had that information. And we did it, and we also had access to a, to a trial of these nice maps I've been showing you earlier on, these perspective maps we've been doing. And, um, this, this, this stuck with that grid approach I was talking about earlier. So it did didn't use the network approach. We haven't managed to do that yet. But in this particular initiative, um, the police came up with, with their own mapping system and they found, um, using, the, using this kind of near repeat strategy um, idea that we were talking about, and they came up with a series of 6,000 boxes, small boxes, um, um, over a two-month two period for this particular basic command unit. And they said, right, these are the more or less 6,000 boxes that we want you to patrol. They're talking to, the, to anybody, well, PCSOs, but also uh, patrol officers, anybody that can manage to do it. We want you to go and patrol these boxes on your downtime, and we think these are going to be the most effective places for reducing burglary problems. Um, in that time, those 6,000 boxes, um, um, in that time, there was a, we had about um, 200,000 officer pings, so we, we were able to use these to see where the location of the um, offices actually were. Um, and just for some sort of context, within that period of time, um, 108 of the, of, the, um, of the crimes within the area we looked at were actually happened in what we call live perspective boxes, these places that, people were, that the police were supposed to be, um, supposed to be patrolling. What is really interesting is that when you have a look at how much patrol happened in those boxes, you get quite a striking story. And the fact of the matter is, this shows you the distribution of the amount of time that was spent in all those boxes. Um, let me just get the exact statistic for you, because it's quite um, insightful. So, we, so of those 6,000 boxes, um, so 3,678 of them, that's uh, six, that's 63% of these boxes received an estimated zero dosage. So no police officers visited more than half of the boxes that were highlighted as high risk. And that just shows, right, that it's all very well to have these maps and statistics in, in, you know, you know, uh, in theory, but actually you need to come up with a very smart way of assessing where to go in practice. They were just given too many boxes. It's over overwhelming for them, and they couldn't, they couldn't use the patrol. And actually, of those ones that did receive dosage, few received more than an hour during the eight-hour period that they were designated as a live box. So, so the kind of, you know, it was, it was kind of an average of, of under, under 60 minutes in these patrol boxes. Boxes. So again, coming back to this thing about assumptions, often evaluations assume that this stuff has just been going on. And in fact, when you look at and if you unpack the picture, sometimes it actually hasn't happened how everybody expected it to do. It's an assumption that we often make, you know, we've put something in, it ought to be working, but actually when you look into it, it's not what you thought it was doing in the first place. Um, the other thing that we were interested in using this dosage, I mean, and there's all sorts of fantastically 
good and valid reasons why these boxes weren't patrolled. Yeah. So um, um, uh, something else that we were interested in looking at uh, the, um, the, the kind of role of dosage is we wanted to see whether or not we could replicate what COPA did in terms of working out the ideal level of dosage in these boxes. Um, and this is, this is a bit confu This is a bit of a difficult um, graph graphic to um, explain. So bear with me for a minute or two. You can see the blue line here is what was going on in the live boxes, and the red line at the top was what was going on in the control boxes. And the control was basically what the live box looked like a week before it was live. So we've got it's very similar in all sorts of ways, but it just didn't have the intervention. And the first thing that we can see that is quite, you know, it's quite it's quite reassuring is that there tended to be um, more um, crime in the control boxes. Um, than there were in the live boxes. That's why the red line is on top of the blue line. But what we wanted to work out is, as the amount of dosage that we put in on, on the x-axis here increases, at what point do we actually see the most significant benefit or gain from the reduction? Yeah, that's what we're looking for. And now, it, now if dosage didn't matter, we'd expect the difference between these two lines, you can see here, the red and the blue line, to say more or less constant Right, if the level of dosage didn't matter to the amount of reduction. However, you can see that it, it doesn't remain constant and that, that, and that at, different, at, at certain levels of dosage, you get, you, get wider, you get a wider difference between those two lines than others. So putting the stats together, we found that, interestingly, the point at which these differences become significant and show most effective reduction are at 13 minutes and that this continues to go on until about 20 minutes and your flat line by the time you've got to about 90, 90 minutes, an hour and a half, right? So interestingly, it did sit with what COPA says. It looks like if you're going to do this kind of patrolling, you might as well do it for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. You don't want to put in the extra uh, added effort of putting in more because you're not going to get any more, particularly a huge amount more reduction out of it, but you don't want to put in less either. And these are the kind of implementation um, messages that we want to we wanna use new data to help the police do. And um, I hope I've kind of convinced you that putting in new innovative data can help us unpack what's going on in interventions um, of, this, of this sort. So that was short story one. And I chose something very, very different for short story two. And something that I think is interesting about this is we haven't really mentioned this very much at this conference. I haven't heard a huge amount of mention of the issue of fear of crime from a, from a research point of view, at least. I'm sure everybody's talked about this, about um, fear of crime in their communities, but we haven't looked at much research concerning fear of crime. And so, again, what I'm hoping to convince you is using innovative data, we can, we can, we can, have, a, we can have a different take on looking at fear of crime. Um, fear of crime policy, um, I'm, going to go, I'm going to come on to it later, but first of all, I just want to introduce you to a new idea in terms of data collection, and I've talked to a few people about this over the last two days. Who's heard of crowdsourcing? Oh, good, you are a good bunch. That's at least half of you. Crowdsourcing is one of these buzzwords that's around all the time. Um, and the idea is that it's this harnessing of information and skills of a large group of people, large crowds of people in one collaborative project. The one that we all know about is Wikipedia. This is a great example of crowdsourced data. Okay, so basically everybody from all over the world puts in bits of, um, bits of information into one source and, and doing that in, in that distributed way means that we end up with something that's, you know, fantastic and often better than some of the parts. Um, Crowdsourcing is, is kind of a, an umbrella term for other types of, um, of, of data collection. And one thing I just want to draw your attention to is this idea of volunteered geographical information. So if you're doing this kind of gathering um, evidence from, from, a, from a community, but you're doing it on a map, it's called participatory mapping. So basically here, people contribute to a creation of a map to represent the particular topic of their expertise. And this, this is, and you can do this with loads of different things. Um, one of the examples is that they did this in Germany and they asked people to look at mosquitoes. They asked the 7,000 people to look at different mosquitoes in Germany and they actually ended up finding a new harmful one, uh, the uh, waterborne one that they needed to do something about. So by bringing together all this information from different people, often online, Line, you can come up with a fantastic new data set. Um, and so we're really interested in this idea of participatory mapping, asking people to contribute data in um, giving us geographical information and time information for us to know what's going on. And this was the kind of data that we used to look at fear of crime. 
Fear of crime has traditionally been measured by surveys. You must have all seen these kind of fear of crime surveys that say, um, you know, how afraid are you of walking in your environment in the dark? Um, you know, how do you feel in your neighbourhood? How do you feel, you know, walking down the street um, in, your, in, in these particular conditions? But what happens is fear of crime is nearly always measured as a static trait of individuals. So in other words, you are Joe Bloggs and you tend to feel a fairly high level of fear of crime um, most of the time. Okay, and that's what the survey says. You're one of those people that's in the high fear of crime category. What we did was we asked, we decided that we wanted to see whether or not it is actually that static, or, or, or actually people's fear of crime, presumably, is going gonna, is gonna to fluctuate, but nobody's ever really looked at this before. So what we did is we designed a mobile phone app to collect information on how, on how concerned about the safety people felt within different settings. And so the way that we did this was we had this mobile phone up and we pinged people and we said, can you just tell us how you're feeling now? Are you feeling unsafe? You're feeling less safe? And we also asked them to tell us when they, in a particular place and time, felt a particular level of fear. So we had this two-way thing going on and we were able to map what was going on in, ter in terms of the way that people felt in their environments over time. It was only a tiny little thing. We had um, 60 participants. So this is kind of a very new idea, using this kind of um, information in this way. And I can just tell you a little bit about what happened with our trial. Um, the one thing about crowdsource information is you get these people called super contributors. I think we all know about super contributors. They're those people that like to go on and give you loads of information. They're going to do it all the time. And in fact, we had one of these super contributors in our sample who gave us 250 time, um, bits of information over this time course. Of course, most of the rest of them just gave us one. You know, so, so there's a real variation in terms of the amount that people will contribute to these exercises. And so you can see the number of contributions of each unique participant here. And we can see our really keen guy on the left-hand side here. Yeah? So you have this kind of distribution, and you have to account for that in the data analysis later on. It makes it quite difficult to do data analysis, but it's just to say this does happen. Here is what's fascinating, right? That is not a static level of fear of crime like you would get from a survey design. This is one um, participant's level of worry over the participation in the experiment. And so for all of these points, they're really point, these are little points. We asked them, how do you feel? Not worried at all, not worried at all, not worried at all. Oh, I'm a little bit worried. Oh my goodness, I'm very worried. Oh, and then I'm, I wasn't very worried in that situation. So this just blows this kind of idea of it being a static trait of people out of the water. People feel fear at different levels in different situations, yeah? And this, is, this, kind of, this kind of information can help us um, understand the fact that we are looking at something different from the assumption that we've tended to make as scientists and practitioners for long periods of time. Um, so past research on fear of crime has tended to use social structural variables as an explanation for different levels of fear. So we've probably all heard, haven't we, that, for instance, the most at risk are females and the elderly. They're two groups that we hear tend to suffer from high levels of fear of crime. Um, also, those who have had previous victimisation experience obviously are, are candidates for people who are going to experience high levels of crime. So what we did with our mobile phone app is we wanted to kind of measure all those baseline things too and see how important they were, were compared to the situational stuff I've been talking about, the setting. And we were able to have a look, do a regression analysis, and I won't go into the details of it, to have a look at how those things panned out um, in terms of their significance to fear of crime. So we had the social structural variables and we had this location tracking data. And to make it very simple, we just had whether or not the person was within that own neighbourhood when they reported that particular level of fear. And we wanted to see of all these things, what is more interesting, um, what comes out as the most significant predictors of people's levels of fear. Um, it, it's really, really interesting to note that when you put these things all into one equation, the only thing that really could, is, is predict, it helps us predict people's levels of fear is where they are. It's whether they're in their own local neighbourhood or not. And when you put this information in, along with age and gender and all those other things, those other things fall out. As, uh, they, they, they are not significant. In this particular case, they didn't come out as being significant. So, it's the, so there's this locational aspect of fear of crime that we need to be doing something about as policymakers. And so far, nobody's been really thinking about this idea of treating fear as a situational factor and thinking of hot spots of fear 
as well as hot spots of crime. So this, the, the, we kind of got into this crazy idea and we've done a bit more mapping on looking at we can come up with fear hot spots. And so these, this is just using another source of, 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 um, of crowdsourced data. And we can see some different um, examples here um, of where people in London think that there's a big problem with, on the top left-hand side here, abandoned vehicles. On the top right hand side, dog fouling. On the bottom left, graffiti. And on the, on the bottom right, litter. This is where people, th it's not where there's recorded problems, this is where people think there's problems with those things. And so these are fear hotspots. And surely, as policymakers, we can start thinking about, about doing some sort of interventions that help out with, within, within these particular um, situational contexts to make people feel less fearful. Okay, so I hope that my two. Um, I hope that my two short stories inspired you a little bit into thinking about how we can use new data sources in thinking about crime policies. And just finally, I wanted to say a few things about, um, about what we need um, in terms of evidence um, when, we're plan when they're planning crime prevention. Um, a, a few people have talked about this over the last couple of days. And, when, and when, we, when people keep saying context matters, we really do mean that we think context matters. Um, what, I, what, what tends to be the case um, when we're thinking about evaluation evidence, and again, Peter Martin mentions a few great sources of looking at evaluation evidence to tell us what works and what doesn't work, is they tend to, to synthesise all this qualitative data, quali um, quantitative data on the amount of reduction you get or the effect that you get um, on different types of um, um, evaluations to make statements about what works. So you, what you do is you'd have a number of different trials of a particular thing, such as a burglar alarm, for instance, and you kind of look at whether it made things better or worse scientifically, and then you're, you're over, you're over, you come up with a combined overall idea um, of whether or not it makes things better or worse. So you've kind of, what you've done is you've averaged across all those different evaluations. And you can make general statements like CCTV, right? CCTV tends to work, right? So we can, we can do those things. And a lot of the way that the, that the evaluation evidence um, and research has happened in the past does do things like this. We can get that evidence about whether things, as a general plan, work or not. But... And this is what we need to be, coming back to our assumptions, right, this is what we need to be answering the question to. Is it safe to assume that it will work for us in our local conditions with a, with a particular type of problem that we've got as practitioners? It's all very well someone saying CCTV works, but will it work for me? Is it worth investing in this particular kind of context or this particular type of place? And we really strongly believe that practitioners need to know that. Okay, they need to know that as well as whether it's just going to work or not. And we're, we're absolutely, honestly, um, we're, we're real advocates for people, you know, people, uh, researchers collecting more information than just does it work or not. And if we, if we really encourage people to do that, we can come up with more, what we, what we hope is frameworks which can better enable us to think about the local conditions element of whether evaluations work or not. So at, at the Jill Dander Institute, we've been doing some work thinking about, we came up with a framework. Well, what do we think that decision makers need to know when they're actually implementing things in practice rather than this kind of sky high, does it work or not? So obviously you need to know whether or not something works. You need to know um, whether or not generally it's a good idea. Whether, whether, I mean, we said, uh, um, Anna was saying yesterday, boot camps generally don't work. CCTV generally does work. We need to know those kind of things. But we also need to know a little bit about how things work in different locations. So, for instance, an example is street lighting. Right? Street lighting initiatives are a really interesting one because people put these in to reduce crime. Think about why that might happen. Okay, why does it happen? It, I, I, in fact, if anybody's got time at coffee and they're interested, I can tell you a few of the theories for why that happens. But thinking about why it happens, help us start thinking about what plan we need to do and how we need to put things in place. So that's what we call a mechanism for how it works. Then there's what we call moderators. And these are the contexts that Anna was talking about yesterday. That what are the things that influence the activation of these different ways of things working in, in practice? So, for instance, our, our, the settings we work with are very different when you think about it. The uh, central business district is very different from a residential location. It's very different, again, from an airport. You, we need to think about all these different contexts and how we can expect this particular measure to work for us in those places. Um, 
I don't know about you, but one thing that I really, really does annoy me is that very often evaluations don't tell you much about actually how things were done or what challenges there were to implementation. So a great example in the UK is um, alligating schemes. And these are kind of, this, this is one of those kind of quaint things that works in the UK context. It might not necessarily work very well elsewhere, but we've got lots of terraced housing, right? And what we need to do, what we sometimes do to, um, to make that less vulnerable to burglary is we'll gate off the back alley of that terraced block of housing and we'll give the keys just to the residents. Yeah? So that only residents can access those spaces. And that means moving it from um, a general right of way right, to something that's private, a private space. There are red tape implications of doing that. And it takes a lot of effort and work. And you have to get the community really engaged and keen on doing this. You need to get loads of signatures from everybody saying they're happy for this to happen. That is an implementation challenge. And unless we record those kind of things, somebody going in to try and do it somewhere else wouldn't know how much of a challenge that was and how to go about doing that. So that's what we mean by implementation challenges. And finally, another key one, and we really are lacking in data on this, is the economics of it all. So how much is it going to cost? And we found very, very poor information out there on how much things cost. And when you think about costing, it becomes complicated because it's not just about equipment, it's about people's time, it's about, um, it's about the amount of, you know, the amount of petrol you've, you've got into these places. So we're actually also trying to develop tools which enable us to better capture the costs so that someone going into this will know that there might be hidden costs that they hadn't thought about. So these are all things that we think, and we call it ME, it's our friend ME, these five things, we really believe that if we can collect information under these five things, we can help thinking about what decision they makers actually need to know when they're coming up with doing something in practice. Um, let me give you just an example um, before I conclude. So classically, evaluation designs do this kind of thing. What they do is they measure performance on something, on some sort of crime um, measure, um, before some intervention. Then they do this exe intervention thing. Here's my intervention, and then they look at the performance after intervention. And what they're hoping is that the performance after is better than the performance before. And we call this kind of approach an OXO design. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with these designs is what the hell is that X, right? OK, so what we're, we're hoping Emmy will do is unpack that X for people. So let me give you two examples. So if we've got CCTV, which is, seems to be a good strategy to use, right? If we're thinking about, um, a, a, about different settings or what we might call context or moderators, putting CCTV in, in a public housing setting is incredibly different to putting it in, in a car park setting, isn't it? They're two very, very different things when you think about it. The systematic evidence that we have got shows that if you have a look at the expected outcome that you're going to get, you're, gonna, you're far more likely to get a reduction in crime problems in a car park setting using CCTV than you are in a public housing setting. And what we're talking about is documenting all these variations for people in a way that makes it easy for them to understand so that you'll know if, you're, if you've got a public housing setting that it might not be a good idea to invest in CCTV in this particular context. Okay, um, and so my, um, and a second example here is hotspot patrolling. I've been talking a lot this morning about hotspot patrolling. Um, but it turns out that there's different types of implementation of hotspot patrolling. Okay, so there's these traditional patrol approaches that just quite literally put legs out on the streets. And then there's problem oriented policing, which is much more about understanding the local conditions, thinking about um, responses. It's still a policing hotspot strategy, but it's, it's done with more thought and more problem solving. And just that difference in implementation plans uh, leads to an ex a difference in the expected outcome. Um, if you do additional police patrolling, you're going to get a modest um, reduction in crime being more likely. If you do a problem orientated policing style, you're going to be looking at redu po possible reduction of twice that of the, of the traditional patrol. And so, again, this is looking at variations, this time in implementation, how that can lead um, to different expected outcomes. So, um, all this stuff we're putting together and we've put it into the crime reduction toolkit, I would really love you all to look at that. Um, and if you can give us any feedback, please do email me because we're really keen to see whether practitioners like it or not. Um, we've, been we've been working really hard to develop this tool. And what we've done is that 
Emmy I just talked to you about, we've, in, in all the cases, for all the different intervention types that we've got evidence of, we've, we've highlighted whether or not we've got decent information under those things, and we've highlighted how good that information is. This is the front page. What happens when you click on one of these things is you're taken to a summary which speaks to each of those different elements that I just talked about. So, for instance, under the alligating one, it does tell you about red tape under the implementation bit and so on. And we've done this in a, in a nice shorthand way for practitioners because we know you're busy and we know that reading realms and realms of this stuff doesn't help. And that's why we've tried to boil down the really important information under these five things for practice. Please do, I'll give, um, um, please do email Email me if you've got any reactions to this particular um, toolkit. And we hope that it could be something that you might be able to use in practice. So any feedback, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so just to summarise, crime science aims to use scientific methods to find ways to cut crime. And hopefully by using science, we're not making too many assumptions. Um, multiple disciplines and innovative data can be used to generate useful, refined products for reducing crime and promoting safety. And some of the stuff that I've been talking to you about this morning, I, I mentioned we, ne we, I, we needed a mathematician, a computer scientist, a statistician, a geographer, um, a, cr a criminologist, a psychologist, and we needed all those approaches together to do this kind of work. Um, in order to understand the likely effect on an intervention in a particular set of conditions, we think we need to consider the impact of these ME variations. Um, and just to come back to that Ponzo um, illustration that I, sh I showed you before, in some as scientists and practitioners, we need to understand and assess the assumptions that we are making. And I think that's the kind of what I want to be the take-home message of what I've been speaking about this morning. Thank you.